All right, let's begin. Um, thank you for coming to our uh, sponsor showcase presentation, Success from the Platform Up, um, here in beautiful Amsterdam. It's an honor to be speaking to you today. Um, so who am I? My name is Josh. I have been in the Drupal community for 11 years now, and um, I've started a couple different companies. Um, I've done a lot of trainings at various points. I built a Amazon machine image that a lot of people used back when that was first the new hotness. Uh, and I'm a co-founder of a company called Pantheon, um, which is a professional website platform. And basically, the purpose of my talk is to explain why, what I mean by that phrase, professional website platform, and why it's necessary. Not necessarily why you should you know, w choose us, although I hope you all use Pantheon, but really our perspective on the industry that we're a part of and the uh, trajectory for Drupal and why platforms are the future um, and other things are not. So, um, Pantheon, the professional website platform. We chose those words relatively carefully. Um, it's, it's, a, it's for websites, it's a platform, and it's for professionals. It's professional grade. So there are many platform as a service companies out there. You could do something with Heroku, you could use uh, Red Hats. Uh, so for, we'll take them one by one. So Heroku is a nice website platform, uh, or not, I'm sorry, not a nice platform for web applications. It's actually not so great for websites. Um, mainly because they don't handle state and content as a choice. It's a design choice on their part, but it makes it kind of a non-starter for trying to run Drupal or any other open source CMS. Um, there are, are other up-and-comer platforms like uh, Red Hat's OpenShift, um, which I would say is not quite professional grade yet. It's a little bit still um, in flux and kind of has some of the same problems as Heroku. And there are our wonderful competitors in the, in the Drupal space uh, platform from Commerce Guys, which looks really cool to me. And of course, uh, Acquia, where they have a cloud thing that kind of qualifies as a platform, so good for them. Um, and it, it, everyone's doing this because it's kind of clearly the direction that the market is headed. Um, and uh, that's what I'm here to talk about. So our mission is to power the world's websites. Um, that's what we do with our platform. But I want to talk about the web as an industry, since it's, uh, we'll, we'll sort of frame things at a high level and we'll get more low level later. So. I have statistics from uh, the U.S. market, um, and uh, I, I can, you can extrapolate to the EU market and to the global market, but these are numbers that are, uh, are relatively real. So every year in Estados Unidos, there are $500 billion uh, spent on digital marketing, um, and that's everything from social media to uh, AdWords to websites to probably like apps that qualify as marketing in some sense. I mean, it's a very broad uh, category, but it's an awful lot of money. That's a pretty, pretty big uh, pie to slice up. Um, 106 billion of that is spent in online advertising, and that is primarily uh, the revenue of Google, Facebook, Twitter, and a number of other companies. That's kind of where they make all their money, is through the online advertising market, and, and that's a healthy chunk of that pie. But a larger slice of that pie is spent on websites. Um, and that includes the professional services to build websites, the technologies uh, if you need to license them or, or otherwise, and then the services that are used to run them, um, services like platforms or traditional hosting providers. And it makes sense if you think about it that the website slice of the pie is bigger than the advertising slice of the pie because there are lots and lots of people that, that build websites and don't spend any money on AdWords, but nobody spends any money on AdWords unless they've got a website to link to. Um, so there's some logic there to that equation. So the, the point of this is to say that uh, if you, you know, there's a, there's a very large market here and websites are a very uh, important part of it. Um, and if we look at the, the, the movement into, into CMS as a, you know, basically nobody wants to build a website by hand anymore or not that many people do. Any, how many of you in the, in the crowd here would self-identify as a developer? Okay, so quite a few. So how many before you found Drupal or something else wrote your own, and I will say air quotes, content management system? Right. Well, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I owned it. I had a, a, a blog, and uh, I wrote my own uh, template and everything for it, and I had my, like, my special text file format that I invented for myself that was like the repository of the blog posts and did that for years and years before I realized that I, there were a lot of other things I could be doing and I picked up a CMS and the rest was history. So uh, that's something happening across the internet. And if you break down the market of websites running on CMS by volume, this is what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to uh, make a few notes about this uh, chart. So WordPress is by volume the clear market leader. 
um, which is, it's a very easy to use tool. And I think a lot of that actually by volume is the 70 some odd million blogs that are on wordpress.com, not all of which are actually active. So there's a, it's, I think it's still clearly in the lead though, just in terms of sheer numbers. Um, uh, Joomla's uh, second, Drupal's third. Drupal, if you, if you sort it out by who powers large websites, Drupal has a much larger percentage of that market. Um, so I don't think that this has any like danger sign for Drupal at all. All of these numbers are gradually trending up in general as, uh, as others are going down. Um, I also want to call out at the end of this line Squarespace, which is in this, um, in this uh, graph is being represented as 0.1% uh, of the market. But Squarespace is actually rapidly rising. Um, they, were, they, were, they were not even on the chart a year ago, and they're, they're going up pretty quickly. Uh, I think they have a tool that can actually compete with WordPress.com for a lot of people's businesses, and they're clearly going after it. However, this chart is kind of a lie because it looks at the, uh, it's, it's saying that the, it's, it's omitting the true market leader. The true market leader in CMS is none. Um, none runs 60 something percent of the internet. And what none is, is it means that the, the box that scraped the internet that analyzed sites to provide this graph couldn't identify the technology behind the website. Um, and that breaks down to a combination of things. It's um, sites that are just static HTML. There's a, still a lot of those out there and a lot of them being built. It's uh, sites that use like proprietary or obscure content management systems that are so you know minute in their market share that they, they didn't you know they couldn't this actual the numbers behind this graph go on for about another you know 200 places in the long tail people that are at like 0.02 percent of the market um, none also includes all the CMSs that we wrote before we found Drupal. Um, and there's a lot of those out there and still more being built today. Not so much in PHP now, but if you look at what people do in, uh, in the Ruby world and the, the Python world um, and, and in other places, there's a lot of like inventing new CMSs still going on, which is, which is fine. Um, but those all qualify kind of as none because they're not really a, there's no appreciable uh, market share. But the, the, the ones at the top, WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla are, are clearly, they're kind of leading that market. And they're all open source and they're all PHP. I think that's worth noting and is kind of an important point. And if you think about how the website market breaks down, this is how we at Pantheon see it. So you think about who has the money to buy a website, right? There's, there's on, on the one end of the spectrum, there are sole proprietors. And these are people who essentially operate their own business and operate their own website. They probably also do their own taxes, file their own payroll, mow their own lawn. Like these are people who are doing all this stuff for themselves because they, they run a small business and so forth. And their budget is somewhere between $100 and $1,000 a year maybe. Um, and they're using tools like GoDaddy or HostGator or WordPress.com or Squarespace and they're, they're kind of cruising along at a low level. At the far other end of the spectrum, you have like the top of the market. These are like the Fortune 500 companies, publicly traded companies, giant companies that will spend a million dollars or more routinely on a single website for some reason. Um, and uh, they, they've traditionally been dominated by proprietary systems like Interwoven, Adobe CQ, uh, uh, WebSphere, uh, uh, OpenCMS. These are all things that we may never have worked with, but these are the giant uh, sort of enterprise grade content management systems that have been installed by big consulting companies inside large corporations for a long time. Um, and our good friends at Acquia are doing an excellent job at positioning Drupal as the open source alternative in this space. It actually, I think they get far too little credit for breaking into that market because it's not easy to do and it's important for the long term legitimacy of the project to like show that you can take on the Goliaths in the space. So I give them a heck of a lot of credit for that. But there's an awful lot of room between $1,000 and a $1 million as your budget for a website. And in the space that like, you look at, it's essentially, I mean, it's not just corporations. It's also nonprofits. It's higher education. Um, it's, it's some small businesses, too, that are more aggressive and more forward thinking about their web strategy. Inside that corporate space, open source is really winning. That's where you see uh, uh, Drupal and, to a lesser extent, WordPress really, really starting to take off and, uh, and, and dominate. And that is in part because in this space, the developers of the websites often have a large role in picking the technology. And so they pick the things that they find that they like to work with the most because it's what will make them most efficient and their customers tend to just trust them. And 
that's, that's where a lot of the, the sort of uh, uh, energy flowing into the Drupal commercial ecosystem comes from. Um, there's some from the high end, and there's, there's certainly some stuff. Drupal gets used by people on a tight budget as well, but it's usually a technical person who, can implement, who likes Drupal and can <laughs> implement it for themselves. It's not typically um, someone who's just you know, not technical and looking for a tool. Um, but in that middle space, because you do need a full-powered full, full powered content management system for a lot of these sites, and Drupal is a you know, no license fee, great community. We all know the reasons to pick Drupal. That's where a lot of the economic uh, energy is coming from. The point here is that the web is in a state of transition away from custom bespoke solutions and like read only publishing and towards content management solutions, read write publishing and like actually even more interesting distributed use cases like headless Drupal and so forth. Like we're in the middle of a change. Nobody who redoes their website now says, ah, you know, let's just do it in Dreamweaver. Like we just use static HTML for everything, right? There's, there's static site generators are actually having a moment of coming back in vogue among front end developers, but that's actually for other reasons. People don't sit down and say, I don't want to be able to edit the content of my website. I would like to have to call a developer to be able to change the words on a page. Nobody says that anymore, and for good reason, right? It's democratizing to allow more people to take control of their web presence and their customer's experience on the web. Um, and none is on its way out. So uh, also you see uh, less and less frequently do people say, you know, the best thing for us to do would be to try to write a new CMS from scratch. Um, I think we really got a bunch of fresh ideas that have never been considered by anyone else, and clearly we have the most talented people in the world here, so let's just take on that huge hairy challenge and, and nail it. Most people are learning to be a little bit more humble and say, well, you know, this is actually a problem people have been working on for a couple decades, and there's a lot of stuff out there we can just pick up and use and see a lot more value by building on top of existing systems rather than writing our own from the ground up. Um, but in this context, I believe that Drupal is too hard and too expensive to reach its full potential um, as currently constituted. And I will couch that in, uh, in saying I don't think that this has to do with the complexity of how difficult it is to develop for, for Drupal or even, even thinking about how, how much more complex it may be to work in Drupal 8. I don't think that's actually the problem. Um, it's also obviously not that Drupal has like a high license fee because it's open source. Um, but the problem is that it's too hard and too expensive to run and maintain Drupal sites over time. Uh, it's not about the individual website. It's about whether or not an organization or a company or an institution can actually adopt Drupal as, a, as its go-to solution for all of its different problems that it has on the web. Maybe it won't solve 100% of them, but it can be their go-to. The long-term costs of running the open source software fall on the organizations, and many of them are either you know, get burned because they radically underestimate these costs, or they look at them and they say, well, you know, I kind of would rather just pay the money for Sitecore because I won't have to deal with all this stuff. The expensive uh, part of Drupal is the hassle um, because open source costs you in time and stress. And for many people who would like to adopt uh, a Drupal as an open source solution now, they're deterred by the cost of getting it up and running and the cost of managing uh, the sites over time. We often see Drupal as this amazing like, set of Legos that can be built into anything that you can dream. If you can dream it, you can Drupal it. Um, it's a wonderful slogan. And, uh, and, and as a developer, with like, the way that the, there's a nice architecture, there are good APIs, and as a developer, this is often, you know, especially a developer who's experienced with Drupal, this is often the case. Like you can say, yeah, I can just plug this into that, and I'll make a view on top of that, and my content type, and bam, I've just, you know, I was at a hackathon last night, and these, these kids cloned, essentially cloned the functionality of IMDB in four hours. Now, I mean, there's a lot of more stuff to do, but the heart of what that was doesn't take that long to put together in Drupal. And, and the, the ability that we give people to really quickly model different content, different access controls, essentially do your data structures, that's an immensely powerful set of features. But to someone who's looking to adopt Drupal as a holistic technology to solve more than one particular problem over the long haul, the experience is more like this. There, it's confusing, it's inconsistent, um, there's a lot of hidden complexity that isn't apparent right away. It requires knowledge that's not very widely held or well documented. And there's a lot of responsibility that's thrust on the implementer to sort of carry the, uh, the weight of Drupal over the long haul. Um, and, th and that's where the expense comes from. Um, I believe that open source solutions need platforms in order to reach internet scale. Um, the reason why WordPress is so dominant in the volume graph is because it has a really great platform called WordPress.com that has 70 million blogs running on it that nobody has to worry about maintaining. 
Um, without platforms, open source is still thrusts far too much responsibility on an IT department or a web developer who's playing double duty as a sysadmin or an actual sysadmin who has like 50 other things to worry about or, worst of all, nobody. And then it's like uh, you're just, the clock is ticking until something bad happens. Um, because it's not just the LAMP stack anymore, right? If you're thinking about building a, a more modern uh, Drupal infrastructure, there's a lot more that you've got to be thinking about in terms of providing you know, the best possible performance, the best possible uptime, and all the features that you're going to need. Um, and it's not even just about having Varnish and Git. It's about like, actually having some DevOps capabilities so that you can iterate on your site without breaking it. It's about being able to scale if you need to. That's kind of complicated. That's, all these things are very different than building websites. And right now, you either have a kind of pissed off, overburdened, reluctant IT organization doing this stuff, which is out of its strike zone, or it's the web developer who should be building the website, except they got sucked into doing all this stuff because they were, maybe they enjoyed it at first, but now it's their responsibility. They're the only one who can do it. It's no fun. If you think about it, there are all these challenges that go into launching, running, scaling, and maintaining websites that are really different from the challenges of thinking up, uh, inventing, and building websites. So you have all the website DevOps problems, like your 24-7 on-call, security, high performance, high availability, workflow, presumably everybody should have that now, uh, version control, the actual stack itself, the operating system, maybe hardware even, if you, if you go that far down the stack. Um, those are all very different disciplines than thinking about the brand, the content strategy, and so forth, the UX, the information architecture, the front-end development, the actual CMS development itself, whatever tool you choose to use. Those are pretty divergent skill sets. And there are people that have both um, in this community, and if you, it, but it's a small group of people, and they're all like booked for the next six months, and they cost a lot an hour. And we can't scale our adoption of Drupal relying on these very scarce unicorn-type resources who cross the streams and have all these skills. Um, we need to, in order to make Drupal cheaper and easier to implement, we need to take the skills on the left, which thank goodness, because it, through, across site after site after site are largely the same thing, and turn them into technology, um, and allow our, our creative people and our human minds to focus on the problems on the right. This is kind of similar to something that uh, Dries was talking about in his keynote, where if you think about as the project scales, the um, costs of participation go up. And part of that has to do with complexity. And so I believe that platforms by, can leverage technology to radically reduce complexity by taking a large set of problems off the table, so to speak. So you no longer have to worry about the things on the left. And as the, the difficulty and complexity of the things on the right grows, you can devote more and more time and resources to them, in addition to enjoying the fact that the things on the left are probably better done by software than people anyway. Um, and this is like, we have this nice little fun graphic. It's like the road to server hell. And it's like, you know, you start out, you're like, well, I've got a dev server. And, you know, you, you go down the path, and at the end, you've got a million servers, and you're on call, and it's no fun. And it's, it's, it's honestly, um, a lot of developers, and, and I, I myself am in this category. Like, it's fun to tinker. It's fun to build, like, a virtual machine and, and set up a bunch of packages and get something working. But taking responsibility for that for the next several years is, a, is not something to be undertaken lightly. And I think we get away with it a lot of times because we're lucky, but uh, I don't think we're going to be able to get 10 times as many Drupal sites out there in the world with getting lucky. So uh, platforms are kind of like another way of saying the cloud. Um, I used to go around and do talks about Drupal in the cloud and sort of you know, regret some of the things I might have said several years ago, but whatever. <laughs> uh, I feel like the cloud has made a lot of promises, right? The promises of the cloud are instant provisioning, no maintenance, the ability to scale smoothly, um, that cloud should work for any size business or any size project, but maybe not all the way down to the person who only has $5 and is doing something for their softball league, but maybe a good cloud could work for them, right? If it was set up right, why not? if their needs are modest. And the idea is you have fewer headaches and you're innovating continuously. You're sort of on a train with a bunch of other people rather than in your own little box in your closet or your co-location facility. And that's the idea. Um, but I think for many people in the website space, the cloud, like Amazon EC2 or Linode or Rackspace Cloud, has honestly just been moving servers from one place to another. Switching from physical servers to virtual machines and moving, you know, going from, if you were on site, your, your data center to some cloud hosting. But it's the same essential thing. You're just having somebody else worry about the power, which is not nothing, but it's not 
that that's not what those, the, those promises were, right? This promise is a lot more than just like getting the server out of your facility and into someone else's facility, um, whether it's virtual or, or bare metal. Um, and, and, and it's the same old problems. Like you have the same problems with most cloud implementations now as you did. It's just that there it's in someone else's building, right? You, you provision things one at a time. You maintain things one at a time. Scaling is kind of uh, a stressful white knuckle affair uh, that involves a lot of uh, voodoo and knowledge that is not widely held in the community. Um, you can up only upgrade things one at a time. It's, it actually, I mean, it probably is, it's nice to be able to revision a new server one at a time via an API versus via faxing someone an order form, but it still doesn't, you know, you're still, you're still focused on that problem and not the website problem, right? So it hurts your innovation, right? So you, get, you give your headaches to someone else, but it still costs you a lot of time and money. Um, and, and I think to date, we have yet to see the real value of the cloud um, very widely in, in the world of websites and in Drupal in particular. Um, and that's what we are trying to solve. I think the platforms are trying to solve this problem. They're trying to provide the true value of the cloud to the websites. So the idea is that you can run at massive scale without having to re-architect uh, your website as it grows. Um, the idea that your use case can be contained um, and that it's not a, uh, a one-off uh, cluster that somebody built over here or a virtual machine that was you know, provisioned by somebody's script over there, that it's a homogenized infrastructure and that it's all uh, clear throughout, and that the platform is actually focused on the website problem, not on some generic um, PHP problem or Python problem, because there's a lot of things that go along with building websites that don't necessarily apply everywhere else, like you need to be able to save files. Um, that's an important problem to solve if you're a platform. Um, and so to bring it back around to our thing, like clearly we come from the Drupal uh, community, we are focused on providing value to the Drupal community, and I think we actually do manage to provide value with our platform to this. So the idea that you get instant provisioning, no maintenance, smooth scaling, we're continuously innovating under the hood. Um, we've done a lot of things this year and we'll continue to do a lot of things in the years to come. And the idea is we try to make it so that it can really work for any size business or product. A true platform should work for a small business or a personal project and a giant enterprise because that's what a real technology solution does. You don't actually need special solutions for different size customers. You just need a solution that actually solves the problems and that can go to scale. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we've built. Um, so. That is my presentation. It's about how to be successful and why platforms matter. Um, I hope that wasn't uh, too pitchy for you, but I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. If anybody has a question. <laughs> yes, do you mind uh, speaking with the microphone because they're recording and it'll be easier for future generations to benefit. Okay, um, so it sounded like that you actually had two questions. Let me see if, tell me if this is right. One question was, how do you approach the problem of scaling in a way that doesn't require you to, doesn't break the bank? Um, and the other one was, with Drupal 8 on the horizon, you know, and you're thinking about just getting into Drupal, should you be considering Drupal 8 or not? Um, so the first question is easier. I think that you should look into the platforms that are available. Um, I have a strong bias about which ones you should use, but you should really look into all of them. Because the, the thing is that a good platform will allow you to start on a relatively modest budget and then smoothly scale you as you need to to a larger and larger and larger, um, uh, 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 a larger size account, basically. Um, most platform companies have a kind of a distinction that they'll make between uh, when they start to offer like guarantees around your uptime and you know higher levels of support and so forth. Um, and you may be able to get a ways before you actually have to engage that side of things. And so it could be relatively cost effective, you know, on the order of a 
a few hundred or small, low thousands of dollars a year to be on a pretty scalable platform and then kind of like just go for it. Like see how successful you can make your website. And if you can make your website very successful and it really matters to your business and you're really growing it, then it should be actually fairly easy to justify the cost of, you know, leaping up to get like a guaranteed uptime contract or be able to sc like scale to millions and millions of page views, right? If you're getting millions of page views, your website is really worth putting a, a good platform behind. So I would, I would look at a, for a platform that allows you to start at a relatively modest price and grow as you're able to grow the, the importance of your website. And for Drupal 8, um, I still think it depends on when you want to launch. Um, it's a little, it feels, I mean, I, I'm super excited about the beta coming out this week. I think that's huge. Um, and, it, it, you know, the, the caveat is that Drupal 8, core contains a lot more functionality than Drupal 7 core did. And you may be able to actually build a whole website without installing a single contributed module, um, like a real first class website without installing, or without installing many contributed modules. The big concern is how long will it take for a bunch of the modules you might want to use to catch up? And so I think it sort of depends on when you want to launch, because if you want to launch like this year, then no, don't do it. Like just do, build something in, in, a, in Drupal 7 and plan to do a re, rebuild or refresh of it, you know, in, in, six, you know, in, a, in a year or so. Um, or if you have a really complex use case, probably don't do it because uh, you, you're going to need a universe of contrib modules in your library that, that aren't going to be there yet. Um, but if you're planning to launch sometime next year and your use case is relatively straightforward, um, I think it's worth considering. You should at least, like, in, the ter in engineering terms, like, do a spike, right? That's where you say, you know what, we're going to spend two days and we're going to look at, like, what it would take to get Drupal 8 close to what we need it to be and evaluate it from there. Like, maybe wait until after the beta comes out and there's a few bug fixes. But that, I think, would be a, a sane approach and, and probably fairly prudent. Any other questions? Yes? Do you mind speaking to the microphone? So as I understand, uh, the idea of a platform includes updates to Drupal to modules that are done kind of transparently on your side. Is that? So I, I believe that an ideal platform should help the you keep the core software up to date, including your content management system. Um, in ter right now, we don't actually do it for you. We just make it really easy for you to do yourself. I would like for us to be able to do it for you if you consent to that. But there are. Um, there are enough concerns around the potential for an upgrade to break something that we wouldn't want to necessarily, we would, we would be cautious about upgrading live websites without first having the owner of that website review the update and say thumbs up. But I think it's technologically feasible. Like this is not functionality that exists in Pantheon or any other platform that I'm aware of for Drupal. But it's, there's no reason, there is no reason that we couldn't say let's get your test environment all updated, let's run all the core unit tests, and let's send you an email that says, hey, we think your website looks good. It's got the update in there. Check out the test environment, and if, it, if, it, if you approve, click here to deploy to live. Like, that should be totally doable, and that's what everyone deserves. Honestly, we don't need to spend so much of our lives hacking it out in the trenches when an update comes out. Like, I think we can make the robots do this work for us, and we as people can benefit from that. We need that in order to scale further, I think. So... In a perfect world, yes, I don't have it now, but I want to. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? So, so what happens when uh, we have specific uh, tools that we need to put on those platforms? Do you also support those? It depends. Um, I think that... Um, in our case, if you have other PHP tools that you want to use, that shouldn't be a problem. But for people who want to run a Node.js uh, app or something in Ruby or they want to be able to compile SAS as part of the platform environment, that's not something we currently support. And the philosophy behind that is what we, we want to be good at what we're good at, and we know that won't solve all of the problems, but if we can conclusively and definitively solve some of the problems in a way that is bulletproof, that's of value. Um, there are, I, but I, I, there are other people that take a different point of view on that, where they, they're, they're thinking that the, the role for the platform is to allow you to run you know, multiple pieces of software in a, the same environment and integrate them. And I think that's a, it, it's an interesting approach. Um, we just have an opinion 
or, uh, for ourselves. It's just that the, on a regular system, you have certain binaries that you don't have on a platform as a service. Uh, it's more like that. Not, so not, what, what in particular? Like for example, PDF generation. We have PDF generation. All right. That's a, that's a really, that's a, so our philosophy has been when there's a common enough use case um, and that makes sense for everyone to run we'll, and, and we think we can support it, we will. So PDF generation totally done on, on Pantheon. There is a, a documentation page on it. It may not be the, we, there are like three or four different uh, binaries people use and we only, we, we picked one that we thought was the best and that we could support and we use that. So it might be that the binary name is different, but like all the, the, Common modules that are used to generate PDFs should work fine. Um, uh, there's, a, there's some other limited use cases like that that we're, we're into supporting. So if you have a particular question about that, I'd, I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards to make sure that you, we can hopefully solve your problem. Yeah? Um, can you say something about your differentiators from Pantheon as opposed to your competitors around sure. rising up? Sure. So uh, I think the things that differentiate us um, from some of the competitors are uh, our ability to scale smoothly. Um, a lot of other cloud platforms actually at different service levels or different sort of um, uh, sizes, they, they actually implement different architectures. Um, and so transitioning between those architectural leaps can be difficult. Um, it, you know, the, the, your application may break, you may have to re-engineer it, there may be unexpected side effects. Um, with one of the things that I think we've done uh, that we're very proud of is created an, an incredibly consistent, um, it's not always 100% perfectly consistent as we found out in a few edge cases, we're working on solving that. Like we really take this very seriously. Consistency throughout the platform. So what works in one place will work in the other. What works in your development environment will work in your live environment. What worked in, your, in, a, in a free sandbox site will work exactly the same way just at larger scale on a much larger site. So that's a differentiator. Um, I think the fact that we really prioritize the developer experience because the, the, the whole, to go back to this thing here, right, the whole, uh, the whole point of this graph is that in that middle market, it's the developers who are making it happen. Um, and the developers are, I mean, the businesses need a platform too because the long-term costs of running open source are kind of a problem that need to be addressed. But if the platform doesn't help the developers have a better life experience and be more productive, then it's not doing its job. And so I think our prioritization of the developer experience is something that helps uh, differentiate us. Um, and then at a, at a technology level, I think, you know, we have a reputation for performance that's well-deserved. We take that very seriously. I think, I don't know, we, I haven't done a, a, a recent kind of like performance showdown with other people, but there was one done last year by uh, a, a, a web developer in Texas, and it showed that we were, you know, we're definitely higher performance and more scalable than other um, available platforms. Um, we support multiple different content management systems, which is not all platforms do that. So that's a, that's a differentiator. Um, and I think we are a platform company and a platform company only. We're a technology company. So you can't hire us to build your website. It's not possible. We won't do it. Um, and uh, I think that's actually important for two reasons. One, for us it keeps us focused on what matters, which is the platform and building the technology and making it better. And secondly, it makes it much easier and more straightforward for us to partner with the developers in the community and the agencies in the community because we don't compete with them. Other questions? Matt Johnson. <laughs> So uh, when, when can we spin up a uh, Pantheon instance in Europe? <laughs> Ooh. Or, or Australia. Or Australia, yeah. Uh, sadly, um, probably not that soon. Um, we uh, are, are working on offering uh, customer service in, in Europe, so on European hours. And we actually do about 20% of our business out of the EU uh, already. So people use it even though the, the location is in the U.S. It's fast enough. Um, but we have made a decision not to open a second data center here until we're fully committed to backing it with a business push, and we're not ready to do it. It's just like organizationally, it's going to take us months to get there. So I wouldn't expect it until later next year, to be honest. Yeah. I was hoping that, I mean, there was a time when we thought we'd be more gung-ho about it and like have it ready for DrupalCon Amsterdam, but it just turned out not to be realistic. It's, it's, it's complicated. All right. 
Okay, so uh, let's say I'm a solution architect and I have an uh, enterprise level website I'm working on. Uh, how do I, uh, and of course, uh, using any platforms, I have a risk that at some point of time, as websites evolve, they will end up in uh, in in that uh, the platform becomes bottleneck because yeah. let's say I have a I need some custom image extraction uh, extraction tool or some ki kind of say a custom schema for solar or mm -hmm. something or I need elastic search and then I I have a risk when I build an architecture when I pr propose solution for clients or something mm -hmm. uh, or somebody I I need to consider this risk yeah. that, uh, eventually I will uh, uh, can <coughs> end up of dropping the platform because yep. Yep. I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I understand the question. How do you work with uh, how the uh, clients or can influence the technology stack of your platform? Ah, well, okay, so there's a, there's a very easy way to influence the technology stack of the platform which is to talk to me and or to David who's, we're at the booth the whole time and, and we really do Actually, we both enjoy talking to web developers um, because that's fun to do for us. And, but we also listen, and it's, we, we get most of our good ideas from you, you guys. Um, we are, again, that's one of the things that differentiates us. We're committed to this community of developers and, and trying to figure out what they need to be successful. That said, there is an inherent, I should have a slide about this in, in part of the thing, because it's like I'm kind of saying platforms are for everyone. And the truth is it's not actually platforms for everyone. Where platforms really, really kill it is when you're like one or two steps behind the most, uh, uh, the most creative and cutting edge use cases. Because platforms are about taking things that are standardized enough to essentially make them really simple to, to get and then having that be just like done. Um, and if you are really, uh, if you're a development shop, and I, I, this is what I did when I was a development shop, so I would not fault you for being here. If you are about like being on the cutting edge of every single technology, then I think you still might be able to use a platform for some of your projects, and you probably want to know what all the different platforms are capable of doing, so you can pick, you know, because there's still some benefits in being able to hand over a solution on a platform to a customer for the long haul. It's just easier to support than if you have to keep track of a bunch of servers. Um, but if you really want to push the envelope, then I think, you know, you you basically, on some level, you're saying, I am so, I'm so on the cutting edge that I will do all of this. Uh, I, I, I know what services I need. Um, in, in some cases, you know, you can, you can get like other provided uh, cloud services for some of the things. So like if you wanted Elasticsearch, you could get that from some other platform and integrate the two platforms. And there's people that are doing that more. I don't know whether that's really the future or not. Um, I, I think there's going to always be, and it's an important role for developers that do the full stack. Full stack development is a real thing. And I think it goes way beyond just like doing the back end. I think it involves d designing and managing the services that your, your application talks to. Um, and so uh, I have an enormous amount of um, uh, not just sympathy but ad admiration for developers that actually go that far with things. Um, I can't support all of their use cases until we understand that some of them are, you know, A, scalable, B, supportable, and C, going to be implemented widely enough that it makes sense for us to do. So like you, you mentioned Elasticsearch. That's one I'm very interested in. I think Elasticsearch Elastic is just going to kick the shit out of solar, and it can't happen soon enough. Because solar is a bear to set up. It's a bear to maintain. It's difficult to configure. It's difficult to customize. And Elasticsearch, essentially, they're, they're running on the same underlying engine. Elasticsearch just said, well, why don't we just not have all those problems and have a way better search interface? And the, unfortunately for Drupal, we built a lot of our like next generation search module integration uh, uh, tech at a time before Elasticsearch existed. So we have this pretty good integration layer with Solar. And if you just set it all up, it, it just works. And it's way better than searching out of the database. But if you want to customize it, it's, it's just not, it's like hard to do. And for us, we, we, we don't support a lot of customization because it's hard to support. Um, but with Elasticsearch, we, we're actually using that internally for projects. And it's much easier to deal with. And we're much happier with it. And I think. If we can get a good Elasticsearch module for Drupal, then we'll see a lot more Elasticsearch on platforms. <laughs> um, but it, it's always going to be a trade-off, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, just about the risk. I'd, I'd suggest it's possibly more risky doing it yourself. Well, well, yeah. You know, so I think you have to. Uh, 
you, you gotta, you, you, you have to understand, I think you know, it's, it's important also to understand where this fits into your, um, you know, if you're doing this professionally as a shop, where it fits into your business. Um, and if you're an organization that's looking to adopt Drupal as, as a, a tool that you use for a lot of websites, where, where your strengths and weaknesses lie. So I think, um, you know, a lot of times um, people, I've seen things where people actually use a bunch of technologies that maybe weren't necessary um, and it, that ended up costing them more in the end because they ended up with a much more complicated solution um, that was, over the long haul, very difficult to maintain. Um, and I think if you're, uh, where we see a lot of people having success with platforms is where they kind of know what their projects tend to look like, they know what their customers tend to look like, and they're interested in taking that knowledge and making it work more efficiently. Um, and that's, uh, uh, and that's, you know, again, they're, they're, and you know, the, the ultimate extreme of that is, and we have some people that do this on the platform, on our platform, and I'm sure there are people doing it on other platforms, where you have somebody who just really like kind of rolls out the same website over and over and over again, um, but they're able to do it at a lower cost and faster and for a larger volume of customers than if they were designing everyone and architecting them from scratch. And so I think that, you know, if we look at the, the whole thing of what we need to scale, Right? If we're going to take over none, we need to be able to build websites much more quickly. And that, that involves taking expertise and, uh, and knowing a certain set of problems and saying, I've got this problem solved. In, in the future, I'd like to actually be able to do more to support the reuse and repetable, re the repetability of solutions for customers. Because I think for a lot of customers who are out there, like nonprofits of the world, uh, you have a question too, uh, we, we can answer. But like, the, I got my start in Drupal with this project called Civic Space which was just take Drupal, make it intelligible to a nonprofit, call it civic space, and tell them to use that instead of this terrible proprietary vendor they were all on. And it worked. Like once it was like, hey, here's a solution for a nonprofit, people understood and they got it and they wanted to use it. When it was like Drupal, which could really be anything, it was much more difficult for them to figure out. And so I think, you know, platforms can help us as we productize Drupal into more industry specific or uh, customer specific type solutions. Your, another question? Yes. Um, how does this all relate to working your dog I think that's an incredibly important question. So the question was, where does this mean things are going with mobile? Ah. Sorry, I'm just skipping through my slides so we have something interesting on the screen. Um, right now, Drupal is, Drupal 7 just got totally screwed, right? Drupal 7, the major development cycle for Drupal 7 happened right about when the first generation of the iPhone came out and everyone thought it was gonna be a dud. Because for like the first year and a half, it was like, it's too slow, it doesn't really work, you know, this gesture stuff, kinda, eh, I don't know. Um, and Drupal 7 was released at a time when the mobile web was not it was, it was, the potential was obviously there, but the industry didn't really think about it, and certainly developers weren't thinking, oh, I gotta make something that works on that kind of device. Um, people who were doing mobile de web development were thinking more about how to make something work on like a Nokia phone, which is very different than building what we all know now to be mobile websites. And so the Drupal 7 in and of itself is just lacking in mobile support in many ways, which is unfortunate. Drupal 8 addresses a lot of those shortcomings. There are a lot of things that you would want to do from a plat from a from a owning your website perspective that a platform can provide uh, like being able to uh, deliver responsive images or dynamically sized images. Um, they're uh, supporting uh, more up-to-date protocols so that mobile websites can load faster. These are the sorts of things that you can totally do on your own server, but these, that's an example of something that I think a platform um, really, really should be uh, doing and considering. We've got some of that. I think we need to do, we need to do more to have stronger mobile support. Um, and that's clearly something we will be working more on. And I think other platforms will also be working more on because it's where the, it's where the whole industry is moving. So I think that the, the benefit there is as opposed to like rolling your own or like having your own server is the innovation around mobile is happening fairly quickly. And it is a obviously valuable, widely head, hel uh, held totally standardizable type of uh, use case. And so it's the type of problem, better, better platform level support for mobile sites is the type of things that platforms should be really good at. So then you can just focus on like getting the right responsive design and they can take care of a lot of the under the hood stuff that's required to make sure that you can deliver those designs and deliver them quickly to mobile devices.